why did Paul say this is a root issue? I, I knew that there was love and money and evil. I understood that, but I didn't focus on the word root. Mm-hmm. And uh, essentially, the root is our belief system. When the belief that money is superior and money is our source for success, significance, and security, then we've been taken captive. Our roots have been infected with the philosophy that is going to lead us into bondage. So that's where it started. You do a great job of unpacking, unpacking three characteristics of roots. What are those three characteristics of roots, and how do they relate to our belief system? Well, the first one is that roots are pervasive. What's below the ground is actually typically bigger than what's above the ground. You know, I, I, I had an experience digging a, a tree up in my own yard and realized, my goodness, uh, these roots are enormous. They spread out everywhere. Secondly, they're, they're, as I said, below the ground, so they're invisible. It's something you don't typically see. And third, they're responsible for the fruit of that tree. Whatever the roots are, will determine the kind of fruit that that tree bears. So those three things relate to our beliefs. Our beliefs are pervasive. A lot of times they're out of sight. They're they're unknown that we're captive by certain beliefs that we've been taught, that we've just adapted to the world's uh, belief system. And thirdly, they're uh, the control factor for the fruit that we produce in our life. And the Lord expects us to produce good fruit. So I wanted to get down into the root issues as opposed to just say, let's clean up the fruit at the top of the tree. Is there a way that you can offer people to be able to diagnose the, the health of their root system? Because as you said, you can't actually see the roots. So how does a person know if their roots, their belief system is really in sync with God's word or more so with our culture? You know, uh, the, the scripture makes that very practical, Matt. Uh, one verse that I like to quote is uh, Ecclesiastes 5.10, where Solomon said that it is the, uh, whoever loves money never has enough money. Whoever loves money never has enough. So if you think about it, he's saying do a practical analysis. Uh, am I always suffering scarcity? Am I always in great need? Then it may be that you have a wrong belief about money. And to analyze what you believe and where your heart is in order to solve that problem as opposed to saying, I just need more. So uh, I also give characteristics of what I call the me tree, the tree that is, uh, has roots that are still around the Holy Trinity of me, myself, and I. And everything's revolving around my own personal needs, comfort, and prosperity. And I give the characteristics of that tree and ask the reader to compare themselves in a way that I hope is non-offensive or judgmental, but allows us to just simply say, do I look more like the me tree or the he tree, which has been transformed at the root level into the image of Christ? What about for someone whose outward appearance financially looks great? They look like they're doing really well financially. Is it possible for that person to also have a root system in need of some some rework? Well, man, I know you've seen in your work uh, how often people uh, are successful uh, financially but miserable on the inside or actually caught up in things that uh, and problems that money can't solve. So uh, absolutely. In fact, the scripture addresses both ends of that spectrum, both people who are in financial pain and in need to those who are on the other end. Maybe they have a great abundance but their heart is not aligned with God's word and not, be, and not really surrendered to the Lord's purposes for that wealth that he's entrusted to them. So absolutely. I think one of the challenges, I mean, I've certainly experienced this in my own work, of, of trying to teach not only wise money management, but biblical money management. I think one of the challenges is encouraging people to do some of this kind of tougher heart work. It seems that people are often looking for three steps to getting out of debt and two steps to investment success. And so how do you motivate someone to do this kind of more difficult work of the heart? You know, Matt, that is a fantastic question. Obviously, from someone who's had a great deal of experience recognizing that we tend to want to jump over it. We just say, ah, that's, that's, uh, that's mysterious. I can't make a formula out of it. So let's just omit it. But what kept drawing me back to that challenge is that the Lord doesn't omit it. 
he points to the issue of our heart over and over and over again. And so all I know to do is to lift up God's word and say, allow his word to do its work. I can't change anybody's heart. Uh, that's, that's an impossible task for me. But I can say that the mystery of transformation happens with God's word. When we ingest it, almost like uh, a plant takes in vitamins and nutrition into its root system, it's, you don't really see what's happening but something is going on that changes the heart. And I'm committed to uh, stay focused on that message because that's where the real um, riches come from. And if you miss the, the real riches of life, no matter how much you have or how little you have, I, I, I'm hoping the reader will say, I, I want that, I desire that, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes to get it. I also go after the issue of external security, external success, and external significance. We tend to define all of that by things outside of us, by what we own. And true riches come from internal success, internal significance, internal uh, security that only comes from the Lord. So hopefully people will see that those three great uh, objectives of life are not met through how much you acquire, and they'll desire the true riches. You know, changing our root system, our belief system, is not nearly as, as easy as changing our investments with an online click of a, of, a, right. of a computer key and such. And so how do you do this? I mean, you, I love one of the, the word metaphors you used of, of miracle grow, really, for our root system. What, what's kind of the starting point for someone who wants to put some of what you're talking about into practice? What happened to me, Matt, was almost embarrassing to admit, but I, I was transparent in the book that I was, although a Christian and familiar with Christian jargon, and I could quote a few verses, and I'd been in church for many years, I was almost biblically illiterate. I did not read God's Word. I really never tried to apply it to uh, practical areas of my life. Like my finances, they were bifurcated. I had a spiritual life and a financial life, and the two would never twain. So uh, in my journey, I began to read God's Word and asked the Lord if I could get to know Him better. And the principles that He gave me to apply enhanced my confidence in Him, they enhanced my relationship with Him, and also changed my finances. So I felt like it was the ultimate win-win to uh, put God's Word into my heart, and I developed a genuine hunger for his word, where it wasn't rote obedience anymore, it wasn't religious behavior, but a desire to truly grow as a person, to be uh, transformed into uh, God's image the way he desired for me to be. And the miracle grow was his word. It was not technique, it was not training, it wasn't Crown Financial Ministries. As much as I love Crown, the ministry I'm called to lead, the real essence of transformation is when we get into his word and let let that go down into our roots. So great. Chuck, who did you write this book for? Did you have a certain target in mind as you wrote this book? You know, who are you hoping will read it? And what primary benefits are you hoping that people will take away from reading this book? That's a great question, Matt, because um, I, I wrote it to the person that uh, is struggling with finances. They, they're, they're stuck they don't know why they're stuck. Maybe they've tried a lot of different things and nothing has really worked. And my premise is that Christians have co-mingled the world's philosophies with God's truth. And they don't know how to parse it out and to get unstuck. And so by going after this definition of riches, saying the world's got their own definition, God has his, let's re-vector your target to God's definition of riches and then everything will get in line behind that in regard to your finances. So if, you, if you're if you struggling and you have financial pain, I believe if you aim at the right target, you will, you will align towards that. Or if you have an abundance but are not experiencing what God promised to those who love him, which is a, a promise on both sides of that equation, that both of those readers would get uh, the benefit of, reading his word and being set free from being controlled by this pursuit of worldly riches, being controlled by 
uh, this commingling of the world's philosophies into the biblical truth, and also from the fear of loss. I think many people today are struggling with a massive insecurity. And I think one of the best benefits from this book would be to get rid of that fear because we don't have to fear, even uh, lose, we don't have to fear losing anything, Matt. And I think that it will deliver on that promise.